The sport of off-road racing is full of incredible stories, wild characters, legends, and even villains. We cover it all on offroadracer.com, but there's only so much we can put down in an article. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper, and that means sitting down with some of our industry's most influential characters and hitting record. Welcome to the Off-Road Racer Podcast, a Mad Media production, made exclusively for offroadracer.com. Each month, we'll go beyond the dirt into the homes, shops, and lives of the most interesting and game-changing icons of our sport. You'll hear about their history, success, failure, and everything in between as we pull back the curtain and reveal the stories of their lives. I'm your host, Matt Martelli, and this is the Off-Road Racer Podcast. I'm Matt Martelli. This is Off-Road Racer Podcast, and I'm here with my boy, Justin Von Mendel. What's up, man? What's going on, Matt? It's uh, great being here, man. Thank you. Yeah, it, we've been talking about this one for a while. Oh, yeah. I'm super pumped. You know, I'm I'm uh, more excited about, like, next year's season and everything that's going on and uh, what you guys got going on. Um, I think the Off-Road Unlimited series definitely is a top-notch, and I'm, a, I'm super excited to be a part of it. Yeah, we're, we're pumped for it. You know, I mean, finishing out the year with the California 300, we are talking earlier, you're, part, you're, you're in there on the points championship, you're leading it, right? So, you know, talk about a little bit about, you know, who you are in your racing program. So, basically, I just started like two years ago. Um, in, never U- raced- in UTV racing, but not in racing. Not in racing, but in UTV racing, you know, um, I've never raced big races. I've never been to a mint 400. I've never been to as a spectator, you know, actually I think my first race as a spectator back in the day was a score Parker 400. Yeah. Um, but other than that and Lorana racing, but other than that, never really put my sights on anything until my brother was like, Oh, let's buy a side by side. It'll be fun. Let's build a race car. That'll even be more fun. And at the end of the day, you know, you're yelling at your brother just going, man, seriously, Look at all this money that we spend, but it's super fun having total fun. Well, especially for you, because you've been in and around racing pretty much your entire life, you know, talk a little bit about your background. So I started about back in the day. I mean, I rode dirt bikes for years and worked for pro circuit Kawasaki uh, for the race team and worked as a independent um, mechanic for a bunch of privateers from doing suspension and motor work for almost everybody in the industry and then the last portion of the dirt bike portion, I got into it. I was uh, working for a rider called Byron Garahan, and we went two years nationally undefeated, won the uh, 2009 and 2010 AMA Pro Championship. And then after that, I kind of like got out of it, got into bagger racing. Uh, me and a partner started up the Performance Bagger back in like 2014, 2015. We started a TV show called Outlaw Baggers that – we had everything all set up, and after we signed and everything, uh, two weeks later, my partner was killed. So that kind of kiboshed everything, and I just kind of sat back and regrouped and figured out what I wanted to do and still have fun. You know, being in the racing industry all your life and then getting away from it, it's it's like taking a part of you out and letting it sit on the couch, and then sooner or later, you're going to walk by and be like, you know, hey, let's let's get back together and get this figured out. So my brother convinced me to get a, to get a car, and then we built the car to you know go out and mash and we're out in 29 palms and um red rock canyon and dove springs and we're just like you know god we're faster than most of these people let's go out there and race and see what happens and that's that whole aspect let's build a race car it'll be fun yeah and i know a lot of guys can relate to that because that's how it all started pretty much probably for everybody well i think i think that you know once you have that taste of blood you know what i mean you're just like you want you want it you know, you want to go back to it. You want to have that, the, not just the wins, but just the, the battle. Oh, yeah. I mean, every time working at that level, you know, we're not coming just to qualify. We're not just coming here to hang out. No, we're here for the win. And that's how I approach every single time when I show up to the race. I'm here for the win. I didn't come here to get second place. Second place is the first place loser. You didn't want it hard enough. You didn't work hard enough to get it. So I put a lot of pressure on myself um, at my shop. I do all my own prep after every single race. I rip the car down. I do it all myself and put it all back together. That way I mentally know that the car is 100%. Now, if we adversely have problems during the races, it's usually 
little stupid things and it ends up costing us because we have an issue that just continuously comes back. It's the gremlin that I think that everybody comes to find out there'll be a gremlin in a car that just always comes back and you end up kind of pedaling the car and figuring out, okay, at this point in time, we can mash the car really hard. And at the other portions, I've got to pedal it and we just got to figure it out and hope we can take the win. Well, I think, you know, with your extensive background in moto, especially with suspension, like, you know, that gives you a bit of an advantage, no? A little bit. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. Ah, that's funny. So you're, you're not going to disclose. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> you no, know. you know, I, I'll tell you what. To be <clears throat> honest with you, um, we looked at racing other organizations, and a lot of people say, you know, why don't you race your local organization? And I say, well, financially, it doesn't make sense. And statically, into the industry of what I wanted to su su get successful with, it just wasn't going to happen. That's what a lot of people don't understand, you know, about racing with the Martellis is that it gives you opportunity. Look, I've been racing for two years, no background in racing side by sides at all. Um, I've been fortunate and blessed that I'm now an ambassador for Polaris Racing. Um, I've got a deal with uh, King Shocks. We drive for King Shocks and we got, you know, support deals from many other companies. And it's really come into light that. A lot of guys need to realize if you want to succeed in this industry and you want to race, you have to race the big races and you got to win. And yeah. the opportunity is only going to be available by racing, I believe, with the Martelli Brothers. No, I appreciate that. We work our ass off to make sure that, you know, we're attracting, you know, sponsors. And that's not just for us. That's for everybody. We understand the more than anybody, the ecosystem of, you know, money going to the racers, money going to us, right? And um, we, frankly, you know, we feel like we're on the very cusp of, you know, what we can provide for the future in terms of, you know, opportunity. When when you look at um, the scale of off-road products, right, globally, it's hundreds of billions of dollars, right? Like, and UTVs and specifically, you know, or UTVs specifically, they're doing something that's never been done. Well, no, I wouldn't say it's never been done, but it hasn't been done in a long time. So a guy goes out and he buys a UTV. He doesn't know dick about cars racing, right? And what does he do? He starts modifying a UTV. The first thing he gets introduced to is wheels and tires, right? And so he gets in introduced to UTV wheels and tire brands, right? And once he does that, he goes and he buys those same UTV tires and wheels for his truck and trailer. So you have this backwards consumption loop. Whereas, you know, before that consumer was, was, you know, into UTVs, he didn't know what, you know, tires and wheels were good. He didn't know what shocks were. They, they didn't know what, you know, they never did an oil change before. So it, it fundamentally changes that consumer and that's extremely powerful because then you have this consumer for an entire life cycle and they're going to consume brands for their UTV, for their trucks, for their trailers, for their RVs. And I don't think that, you know, we've had that, that real paradigm shift before in off-road racing. I know, obviously, you know, like you get into Harleys and, you know, you're thinking like, well, I'm buying a bike. It's like, no, you're buying a lifestyle. And you, you're probably going to end up with a truck and a trailer, you know, some sort of hauler because, you know, this illusion that, you know, you, you're going to buy a bike and besides a bagger and be able to go drive it to South Dakota, you know, is is delusional. Oh, right? yeah. Everybody, you know, everybody suddenly watches Sons of Anarchy and now they're a biker. Yeah. So, I mean, off roads a lot, a lot the same way, you know, but I'm, you know, we look at the future of of what we're laying the foundation for. And we're really excited because frankly, we want to see a day where, you know, we have too many sponsors where we're like, man, we don't, we don't have enough people to, you know, to support that the money's there because of the hundreds of billions of dollars in product that we generate sales in. I mean, when you just look at UTVs alone, sport UTVs, it's, you know, four or $5 billion in the U S alone, you know, just with their sport UTVs, you start stacking up Jeep and, you know, uh, 
uh, the F one fifties and the the you know the Tacomas and the Jeeps and the Raptors and the Bronco and all that kind of stuff and the numbers are astounding. So yeah, I mean we're obviously we're we're putting it all in on the future of off road racing. So appreciate that, but it's gonna be good. We're excited. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of unfortunate, you know, back in the eighties and nineties we saw a lot more cor corporate sponsorship sponsoring the racing industries. You know, I remember back in the time where like. You know, Toyota was involved and they had contingency and same thing with Ford and Chevy and Nissan and Toyota. I mean, everybody was giving out a contingency and it's seeming to be less and less. And I understand the fact that, you know, it, it costs money to put on a race. Right. And, you know, everybody needs that corporate sponsorship so that things can be established and have a really nice, you know, persona for the races and give us racers all this nice, you know, accessories and access to everything and make the track safe and getting everything to that aspect. Um, I think, uh, I think a lot, a lot of companies now um, need to get more, you know, they say they're about racing and I just don't see it. You know, I, I don't see them out there supporting our sport. They don't support, you know, very, very few drivers. And that's like when I go through contingency and if you're not supporting what we're doing out here, I'm not running the stuff on my car. That that's a very important idea. Is we we you know we need to vote with our dollar, right? I mean, you know, prime examples. You look at you know not to get political per se, but you look at what just happened with Bud Light, and that shows you the power of, that we have as consumers, right? We can choose what we support and what we don't support, and so supporting brands that you know, are from racing is very important. Uh, conversely, you know, I could tell you that like they are coming, you know, the, the factories are paying attention. And I think, you know, I think a lot of it was about the death of Mickey Thompson. I think after Mickey died, we lost leadership. And what was unique about Mickey is that he could go into a boardroom and convince people to invest and then he could go out and produce the event, build the vehicles and do everything, right? And um, I'm no way professing to be Mickey Thompson. I'm good at the boardroom part of it, <laughs> but don't trust me to build or fix a vehicle, right? I know I know what's what it is, but I'm not, I'm not that mechanical person. Um, but I think that you know that's what the what we're doing and and that's what the future's about is laying this foundation that they can invest into because it gives them a return right and that that's not just you know what we're doing as a league that's also the athletes right that's us helping the athletes and and helping you guys connect with sponsors you know helping you understand the value of social media and content you know um and and be the product that we need to attract those sponsors. Cause you know, you, you know, coming from, you know, supercross and motocross, it's like those guys have done a good job of creating a, a, a foundation that you can invest into. And you know, every year, you know, what the races are going to be and what the TV package is like, there's no, like, you know, this last couple of years is there's been some wild stuff, right. You know, in competing between moto and supercross and, uh, um, but you know, every year, like, oh, Supercross is coming. Here's it, Anaheim. Let's start. Let's go. Do you remember this. that back in the day at, at LA Coliseum? That place would sell out. Same oh, yeah. thing when they had the Mickey Thompson off road in there. It was great. I, I totally miss that. You know, I was born and raised here in Southern California. This is this my island. No, <laughs> but I, I really miss it being down here in Southern California. Sure. And, and just it's the mecca of everything. I yep. mean, everything start realistically started from here and it expanded from there and beyond. Oh, uh, it blew my mind as a kid, like in San Diego, walking into Jack Murphy through the tunnel, 60,000, 65,000 people going ape shit, you know? And it was, it, it was, it was interesting because a lot of people forget that history. They forget that Supercross was the halftime show for Mickey Thompson yeah. racing. Right. Yeah. So, um, we, we can definitely get back to that and beyond that. It's just, you know, it's laying that foundation for it, for the investment of all these non-endemic brands. And, and we're doing, we've done it with the Mint. We're going to do it with the California 300. We're going to do it with Parker. Uh, and we have a few more races up our sleeve that, you know, as the timing is right, we'll put those into the fold as well. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I was just thinking, um, I was just reminiscing when you are talking about that, how like, uh, ABC Worldwide Sports yep. used to cover all that stuff. And I'd sit there as a kid and watch TV and just going, wow, you know, 
that's what I want to do. Well, think, uh, you know, as I keep saying, think about me and my brother, me and my brother are in, in Kalamazoo in this, you know, fucked up stabby neighborhood. Right. And we lived on a street with a union hall. And so we would, you know, make extra money. We would draw maps, right. Of where all the foreign cars were and hand them to the union hall rep. And he'd pay us 10 bucks or whatever. And then they would get hammered throughout the day. And then they would walk around the neighborhood and flip over foreign cars. <laughs> That's the neighborhood I grew up in. But really? yet, but yet we were like, enamored by wide world of sports like i remember like it's miserable cold out and gray it's like the middle of winter and they're showing the the ball 1000 and it's like you know the tv glow is all warm you know and there's ivan and the bitchin oh yeah tacoma and the toyota and with the cool paint job and you know running through the desert and then they get out and interview him and he's got the cool hair and you know the the <clears throat> the big teeth and you, right away, you're like, this guy's a goddamn rock star. Oh, like, yeah. I want, where is, like, we literally thought that him and all these other, you know, famous racers, Parnelli, you know, all the racers of the day were like hanging out in a bar on the beach in San Diego somewhere, right? Oh, it's crazy. Is, is that like, you know, today's youth, they don't, they don't even know, they know, they see Parnelli Jones, they just think it's a tire brand. They don't realize the man, the legend. Same with Ivan Stewart. Um, God, uh, Walker Evans, yeah. Evans, Evans, his son. I mean, these were kids that were, you know, I remember even when uh, Rob McCachran was driving, driving for the Rough Riders for Ford back in the yep. day, um, you know. How the Rough Riders, that was switch. such a cool thing, you know. I was talking to Frank D'Angelo about, like, who who was the person who put that concept together? And I think it was frank and and bob bauer and uh, just a couple of people who concepted that but man what an impact i mean i it did it I, was huge i still go to people's houses and they have those posters on the wall framed you know like what a powerful thing it you know it, i think it changed the industry you know especially like um when i think of guys like you know who started as a kid of me remembering watching the Hearst brothers, when they first yeah. took those, they had three Chevy trucks, three red Chevy trucks, and they were all trophy trucks. And those were their pre runners. Yeah. And I was like, my God, that is the coolest shit I have ever seen. Dude, and the truggy, like when they rolled the truggy out, I was just like, what in the fuck? You know <laughs> what I mean? Like it was such a cool moment. It's actually cool. They're resurrecting that. It's going to, um, it's going to actually, it's first race back will be the Mint 400 in this uh, next year. I really, you know what I really want to see is those big ass Dakar tr semi trucks. Yeah. Come out there and run. I would love to uh, see that. I would too. I, it was funny. I, I went to Dakar in Saudi and uh, one of my best friends, uh, Archie came over with me because he was the only one crazy enough to go with me. And um, we, you know, we were out in the, the desert waiting for everybody to come through. And those, those trucks came through and we we're in this wash that it was kind of like, it was like Matomi wash, but it was 10 times as big. And dude, it was such, it was so cool. You know, and it's got a waterfall. Like the edge is probably like four feet, four to five feet tall. Yeah. I don't know how that thing comes. And they just come in that thing, just full bore mashing. Yeah. Like the guy's not even letting off the throttle going through that thing at all. Hits the other side. Flies like 10 feet up in the air, almost vertical, lands back down, and the driver doesn't blink. And he's, as soon as the front tires hit the ground, he's on the gas. Yeah. No, they're, they're I I would love to have those vehicles. They could race the Mint because there's no trees. They they There was one guy who came down and ra raced part of Baja, but like he gets to a point and he's like, yeah, I can't drive through. There's This is all trees, right? Um, no, I, I'd love to have them racing with us. You know, that's one of the other bummers about the current political state between us and Russia is like, we were actually talking to some Russian teams about coming over and, and racing, you know, and, and hopefully we can make that work. That would be cool. Hey, if anybody's out there has got one of those trucks. Yeah. Call Matt. We'd love to see those Let's things out there. <laughs> Let's do it. Other, other than that, maybe we just, well, I don't know, we get a, chassis from a trash truck and and set it up you Could know you, i couldn't even imagine like and they just mash i mean they're cr it's crazy though so i got to dr drive one just around a field when we were in germany doing power days and uh we were doing wheelies the guy's like st he i'm driving and he's 
sitting next to me and, you know, guy was Russian and he's like, no break. And I'm like, okay, dude, I got it. No breaks. Right. So he's shifting it, downshifts it. And he's like, gas. And I'm like, give it a little gas. And it does a little whoop. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. And I'm like cruising around and he goes, no gas. And I'm like, no gas. Like I'm confused. Right. <laughs> and he steps his foot over, puts it on top of my foot. We hammers the throttle or hammers the gas and we literally just stand it straight up. Right. And the whole time I can just hear him going, no break, no break. <laughs> because he didn't want us to get whiplash. Right. Right. So, yeah, I was like, okay, that was really cool. And he just goes, move over. Right. And just takes me around on this ride. And just, we just tear ass around this, this field basically in Germany. It was, it was mind blowing. That's, that's so awesome. So, Mitch. Why is this bike so drippy? It's our 23 race bike. We can start up front, work our way to the back. Bones can tell you about the suspension. The rear shock is one of the most critical parts of the bike. Pegs with the titanium mounts. Kashima coating here. Anti-gravity lightweight battery. Young's modulus. Horse and a half. Works, Works chassis lab. More tie than a space shuttle. Really? I might need that repeated. This thing slaps. Slaps. Oh, you should have told me that earlier. You know, it's the same thing with, um, as we're talking about classes and stuff, um, I know it's on everybody's mind about the UTV classes and all the separation of the classes. And then there's too many classes. I mean, it is a big whole ordeal. Yeah. Um, and even like, you know, I relay to you guys and try to give my input to try and help things out to make it kind of like, you know, savvy for all the different classes that are going on. Um, I think the five classes you got, it realistically sets a good basis now. Um one thing I, I really kind of disappointed, and I think a lot of guys too are kind of getting um, shy about, is that there is so many classes, and what do I build my car for, and you know what classes can I race? Even though I have a rally modified car, yeah, I, I can't race it in BITD. I had to have to go and race the Pro Turbo class. Right. Now the car is close, um, but it's still not. not it's not a hundred fifty thousand dollars no. race car, right? Well, no, it's more like. A, a real pro turbo is a $250,000. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing we always look at is like, and what's been tough for us is previously we were one race, right? Now that we're three and we're the big three in the U S like we have a lot more say and we're going to try and do more to control the costs. Like, you know, people forget that the whole value of UTV racing was that it didn't cost Two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a car. Right? So I've I would had a discussion uh, this weekend and previous weeks with uh, different sponsors, and that's another thing that they're kind of just like the prices are just going through the roof. So we looked at racing a class one car at Vegas Torino this year, and it was going to be five thousand dollars for the entry fee, and that's no purse back. That's just five grand to run my car up and down the uh, run up the state, and I was like, that's just ridiculous. That's appalling, and I'm not even getting any money back. You know, where's that money going for, for us racers? It, it's not going anywhere. It's going in somebody's pocket. I just think that's completely absurd. Well, I could tell you, like, I don't know what <clears throat> all the costs are for Vegas Torino, but um, point-to-point races are expensive, right? They're expensive to produce, um, you know, be between the BLM fees and the land fees. And that one in particular, you're crossing over into multiple um, territories, so it's not like the mint where we deal with one BLM or, you know, uh, generally we we're dealing with a three or four landowners, right? So a Vegas Torino, I think it was, if I remember right, I think it was 20, right? So it, it, it's a very heavy logistics cost, but I hear what you're saying in terms of sponsor value and, and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, frankly, that's important to us. It's like, we don't, we understand the value from the marketing aspect, right? And But that's up to us to unlock that value. That's why we spend so much effort on television, on live stream, et cetera. Like the guys who show up and they go, hey, I don't want to I don't want to deal with any of that. I'm like, yeah, I understand that. But if we don't do that, if we don't re return value, if we don't have economic power, we're not going to have racing. You know, and that was something that we learned as we were building the men over the last 12 years was that this old narrative of like, they're going to shut the deserts down. That's not necessarily true, but 
they will shut down off-road racing if we don't wield our economic power and run it like a business. You know, they don't like at the end of the day, the government, it, it, nobody wants to deal with it. It's a pain in the ass. You know, that's true of all racing. You know, if we could just go away and not cause all the problems we're having, I'm sure the world would like that, right? Yeah. But we're not going to do that. But back, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it, it just wasn't like this. And I get it. You know, the government's reforming. Everything's changing. No, it was. It was. Was because, it really? Oh, yeah. Because if you remember, because I was just reading about this, about um, the original Barstow to Vegas race and how that got shut down by the government and the Sierra Club. Over the turtle. Yeah. Well, and it was also, it could have been adjusted. They could have come to a compromise and said, okay, instead of doing this, you know, 600 wide motorcycle start, you know, we're going to do them one off one or two or three or four or five, and you're going to follow this designated path. But instead both sides were like standing there going, fuck you, fuck you. And the, the whole nobody thing was went willing away, to give, right? Yeah, nobody was willing to give. And so I look at this, like, you know, it was funny because, um, you know, I sit on the, the, the tread lightly board and also work with Orba and we got a report uh, a few years ago. It was the Department of the Interior, right? And um, the measurement was that outdoor recreation is 7% of the entire GDP. That means it's bigger than oil and gas. And of that, the majority of that is motorized recreation, right? And so when you understand the, the economic power that we have, and that that's the conversation that we need to have with the government, with private landowners, with, with everybody is that this is not, you know, just a hobby. This is not just, you know, recreational. This is, a, you know, this is a, a business, you know, Oh, absolutely. this is an industry. And so that's happened, you know, numerous times, you know, over the course of our 50 something year history of off-road racing in the United States. Um, but now more than ever, and I could say this because of us and because of uh, because of King of the Hammers, that that conversation is going the other way. Like, I mean, for the first time in history, the BLM has been calling us, going, "Hey, would you would you run this race?" And it's because of the relationship that we have with them, and it's because they see the way that we operate and the economic power that we have. Like, we're. $55 million in impact in Las Vegas, you know, there's, and that's, there's, and that's huge. There's a lot of cities that look at that and they're like, yeah, y y we want that. I mean, right now when I'm working with Barstow and Victorville and the surrounding areas, they're like, whatever you want, whatever you need, they're like they're fantastic to work with, you know, same thing with Parker. Parker was like, when we got Parker, you know, we went immediately and we met with the, with the Indians, we met with the city, and we've already met with some of the surrounding businesses and like people are like hugging me. We haven't even done a race yet, but they know what we're going to do. And uh, we're excited about it. And that's, you know, let's see. And that's exactly why I'm excited about being a part of <clears throat> the unlimited off-road series, because it's, it's just done right. Yeah. And of course, you know, you get everybody that bitches and cries. You're always, you can't always satisfy everybody, 100%. but, but the biggest thing, like, you know, the big that I want to circle back around is about the classes. Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't realize, you know, before we had, God, we had Unlimited, we had Rally, Rally Modified. Yes, too we many. Had, we had, I mean, God, there was just way too many. Now it's simplified of being, there's the Rally class, which is a beginner, beginner class. Yep. The Rally Modified, it's an intermediate kind of almost a probe. And um, I keep trying to tell everybody, look, the Rally Modified gives you time yeah. To really, really work your car, figure your car out, and figure this whole racing portion out. And then when you're ready to go, you're ready to jump into the Pro Turbo class. Yeah, and, and hopefully by that point, you've built up some support, right? It, exactly. And that's what happened for me. Yeah. And these guys don't realize, you know, a lot of guys will come out, they'll be like, oh, I'm a racer. I'm super fast. Look at me. Just ask me. I'll tell you how fast I am. But if you spend the time and... You know, before guys would come into the rally modified class and rather they win or they wouldn't win, they'd be like, oh, well, I'm stuck in the back and I can't pass all these guys. You know, if I'm up in the lead, I'm racing pro turbo, I I'm going to win. Well, they'll go race. They'll jump right out and they'll race the pro turbo class. And then they're getting smoked by everybody because they haven't done the time. They haven't done yeah. the racing to figure out what you need to do with your car to be successful. And then at that point, get ready to make that jump. 
you know, this is my last year of racing the Rally Modified. Hopefully, you know, we take the championship. I know I'm uh, 2.5 points in the lead. Um, I plan on not anybody beating me. I plan on on taking the win. But next year, I'll be racing the uh, Pro UTV class for uh, in the um, Pro R. The nice. Polaris so, and King. So, um, I'm su- dude, I'm super excited. I can't nice. wait. Yeah, I love that car, too. Like, um, you know... Right when I got in that car, the Pro R, I was like, "Oh man, the, I, I like cars that are that move around a little bit, you know, that aren't so planted, that that have that you kind of horsepower to weight ratio that's a little bit more on the horsepower, and that you got to like hold back a little bit and be disciplined." So I really like that platform. I, I think the racing in that class in particular is going to continue to get more and more like higher level of competition, which is cool. That was just talking like uh, if you look at the car, the entries for for uh, Vegas Torino, there's like five cars and just the regular standard classes, and there's like forty five cars racing in the um, in the pro class, which I think is great. Yeah, and that's gonna just keep, it's just gonna keep getting bigger and bigger because I know that the UTV's uh, the manufacturer's platform uh, mental program right now is we want to build a car that's going to beat a trophy truck, and it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting to see the evolution you know, of, of the, you know, vehicles. And we knew like, you know, 10 years ago when we saw the f- first, you know, Polaris, you know, uh, that this was going to just be something that w- would expand exponentially. And it, it's funny. Cause like people talk to me about it now and they're like, Oh yeah, well you think it's going to keep growing? Yeah. I think it's going to keep growing. It's huge. Well, we haven't even, I mean, w- on the West coast, we're a bubble, right? But then when you start going to other areas of the country and other areas of the world and they don't they don't have these things yet, I'm like, man, what I would give to be growing up as a kid in Africa, you know what I mean? And have all that terrain and have a pro R or right? have a UTV. Like that's and then you start talking about the rest of the world and how much dirt they have out there. Like I'm I'm actually enjoying like we're 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 having a lot of conversations with racers in South America because you know, UTV racing has exploded down there, but you know, and and they have some deserts as well, but they're, they look at us and they're like, that's Wrigley field. We want to go there. So I actually just hooked one of them up with uh, Phil Blurt. And I think he's going to rent a car from Phil Blurt and, and race the uh, uh, California 300. So, oh, that's rad. Yeah. I, I, I just think we're just at the very tip of the iceberg of what this is going to be. Oh yeah. I could see like, you know, those guys in Africa being like, we're going to have the cheetah challenge. Oh, yeah. We're, we're going to, we're going to take our pro R we're going to throw a big old chunk of meat on the back and, and try to bait one and see if we can outrun it. Dude. I, I don't doubt that that's going to happen. You know, that that's the funny thing is when I was in China right before, uh, right before COVID hit in inner Mongolia and we were cruising around looking at these this area for a race, and we were in some dunes. And the dunes there were just massive and magnificent. And I'm talking to the guy, I'm like, how many mile, more miles of dunes? And he's like, oh, four more of these lengths that we had just gone. And so we had already gone 20 miles in one direction. So there's another, you know, 80 miles of dunes, right? And those aren't even their big dunes. So when you when you look, take a step back and you look at the scale of the planet and the scale of the things that we're, you know, we're doing, it's like, we're, you know, even the men, it's like, we're in this little hundred mile loop just outside of Vegas. You know, we're, we're on, we're using so little of the Mojave desert that we can't even measure it. It's not even 1%. Like it's a fraction of a fraction. So, you know, there's a lot of places we still have yet to go and to have racing. All right, Chase, number 23, it's 2023. This championship's yours. Let's show these guys what's up. Easy, boys. It's not over yet. Big dog still got to eat. Whatever you say, big dog. Seriously? These fools think I'm fried? They know the deal. It would be almost rad if we, there was some portion where it started in California, crossed over to Arizona, came up to the tip of Nevada, and then circled around. That would be a pretty bitchin' race. But, I mean, I know the logistics of it. It's doable. It's funny because people say crazy stuff like that to me now. And, 
you know, when you look at like what Dakar did in South America and what, you know, like, like the tour de France does, you know, every year they're like, Oh, this is what we're doing. Like it's normal. Right. So it's, it's totally doable. It's just getting people on board. And that's what I just don't get. Um, you know, like, like I said, back in the eighties and nineties, this thing was huge. It was on the worldwide sports. Yeah. And it really is kind of veered off, but you see now it's picking up traction now. Yeah. Things are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, I mean, even on my side of seeing and talking to different sponsors, you know, there's different sponsors that want to start getting into the sport and everything. And like I said, I only use stuff that works on my car. That's, you know, worth a shit. I mean, realistically, 100%, if your stuff doesn't work, I'm not putting it on the car. Right. I don't care how much money that you're giving up for contingency or anything to that aspect. And, um, I got this one sponsor, Ed from, uh, um, X Lux optics, man. And those fucking things, that's, it's the wave of the future. The, all this new stuff that's coming in and these guys want to sponsor of that is the wave of the future that's starting to come into the, everything. And what do they do? So they make this, uh, new light. So remember back in the day they had the Pia's and you looked at the Pia's and the way they were bulbed and signature done. And they were the brightest light that there were. Yep. Well, the engineer of that, the guy who, um, started X Lux lights, um, has done multiple, multiple things for like Chevy, Toyota, GMC, Ford. He's developed all these lighting programs. He's done lighting programs for other companies. I really can't say right now, but you know, he set the patents and everything that everybody's using right now. And he started his own company. And I, I'm telling you, you watch, I'll, I'll bring next time we, we may, I'll bring some in there. It's literally a light that's this big. And it's the brightest light on the market. It's it's unbelievable, dude. That that's the stuff I love. I love the technolo- technological evolution of products, and then throwing them into the fray of off road racing and testing them. You know what I mean? Because inevitably they end up on your car, right? So that that you know kind of test proving ground, I guess, is what I call it. Um, I love seeing that process, and I think um, the more and more that that the uh, offer the unlimited off-road uh, series grows, you know, bigger and bigger sponsors are going to keep coming in. It's going to give opportunity to everybody, you know, every single person I try and talk to, I try and steer them our way is like, come race with us. Just come out and race and see what it's really yeah. like to race a real, a real race. Well, the product definitely sells itself. You know, like you and I were sitting, we, we were sitting at the, uh, the mint 400, having some, probably the best meal I'd had of those three days. Oh yeah. With the tuna you brought and, uh, uh, having a couple of drinks talking about it, but you know, and you know, the camaraderie, the family aspect, like, you know, there's just not a lot of things like this left. No, you know, you know and I forgot, like I told you when we were there, I forgot what it was like to have a good time. Cause I was showing up at the races, you know, having my own business. And I'm like, my whole mental aspect is I have to win. I have to win because it's helping my business succeed. Right. And realistically, I should have been there like, Hey, I'm here to have fun. If we win, we win. We don't, we don't, Right. you know, no pressure, but I put that huge amount of pressure. And then when I sat that night and we had a good time and started talking about everything and you and Josh and the whole crew, I was like, man, I really forgot what it's like to have like just a family good time with a bunch of good friends and go out and race and having a good time. So literally after that, I changed my whole program for my guys. So I made it sure that it's, it's a family and orient, oriented um, deal now. So I make sure all my guys are taken care of. We're all having a good time, but the day before the race, everybody's in race mode. Yeah. This is what's happening. This is it's, we've had our fun. Yeah. Now let's go to work and do what we do. And then afterward, I don't care if you guys run buck naked around the fire (laughs) and well, that, that, you know, that war that you go through and then having the reward after it. Like, I think that's really important. It's in our DNA. I mean, our genetics are on a 2000 year lag. It's like, what are, what were our ancestors doing? You know, 2000 years ago, they were going and conquering shit. And then they're like, cool. We conquered it. Whoop. Let's go have a party. You know what I mean? He's cut off. That's, that's (laughs) it. That's he's had way too many guys. (laughs) No, I'm good, man. No, but the, you know, that's the thing is like, you know, that's in our DNA. And I think that that's important to take a minute and, you know, celebrate, you know, with the people that you just went through this war with, you know, have a barbecue, get around the the campfire, you know, the whole nine yards, you know? And I, I agree. It's, you know what? And like I said, I forgot, I forgot what it was about. And after that is when I pretty much, 
put that back into play for everybody. And we've been having a great time. And like I said, I, I can't wait to win the next race. Yeah. But, you know, there is a lot of pressure, you know, when you get to this aspect of knowing that, you sure. know, you've got to win. You've got to win every single time. So don't let that, like, fool you guys of thinking that, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to go there and wins come easy. They don't come easy. Yeah. This last mint, we won by nine-tenths of a second. And literally, we ran, I ran the last, like, I don't know, what's that from the shooting gallery to the finish line? Is that about 80 miles? Yeah, that's a stretch. 80 miles on a rear flat tire. Yeah. And I refused to get out the car and change it because I knew if we got it. What tire was it? It was the uh, passenger rear. Nice. And the funny thing is, is after the race, I saw the nail. There was a nail and it was buried deep in it. Yeah. And I looked over to the driver's side and there was a nail in it too. And I went, oh, shh, dude, we are so lucky. But I knew it after we we came through the uh, Bottleneck Canyon. Yeah. The car started acting really, really funny. And as soon as we got to the top of that and I got into the dirt and came around the corner, the the car is getting sideways. And I was like, oh, we got a rear flat. And I looked over to my co-driver and I was like, we're not changing it, dude. Let's just run it. If it peels off, we'll just, wreckers or checkers right now, baby. The last lap, let's just make it happen. Right. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, you went through Beer Bottle Pass. Yeah. Yeah, there, you know, that's the bummer is like, you know, we, we spent a lot of time and money cleaning the course up, but like, you know, people go out there and burn pallets and dump, you know, dump trash and stuff. And we try and get all of it, but inevitably we only get a little bit of it, you know? You know, and that angers me. I mean, I live in the desert. Yeah. Right in my backyard. I'm I'm fortunate that I can literally open up my shop and I go up Geiger grade. We have a testing ground over there that we test on. And then out by the Peterson's mountains, we have a hundred mile course out there that we test on. And it infuriates me that people come out there and just dump their shit. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's why we, we do the desert cleanups. Like we have one come in the weekend before the California 300, uh, out in Barstow. And, and, uh, you know, that area is, it's tough because it's easily accessible. So there's a lot of illegal dumping there. And, um, you know, and, and people drag stuff out to shoot, which is a bummer. Cause I'm a, I'm a big, you know, second amendment slash gun, oh, yeah, me gun too. guy, you know what I mean? And I, I love going and shooting the desert too, but I clean my shit up, you know? You know, it, it, like I said, it just infuriates me. I remember the first year that we went through um, the shooting gallery and this is no bull crap. We came through the whoop section over there and it just happened to be, I, I kind of looked over and I looked and I'm like, holy shit, that's a syringe. I go, I tell get on the radio. I go, dude, I don't care if we get a flat tire, we blow the motor or anything. I said, we're driving out of this thing. I'm not getting out, fall down and end up getting AIDS or hepatitis because of some crackhead that's left his crap out here. And that's after we clean. I mean, did we, we pull out before the race, we pull out literally, you know, five, six, seven tons of garbage out of there. And we're the only ones doing it. It's just ridiculous. I mean, well, the, the I, way I get it, I get it over Barstow because you have out Alonto and all that over there and it's, it's not a desirable area. And unfortunately, you know, there are less fortunate people than us out there that live there. Um, I don't know if you saw my post, but like a couple weekends ago, I came down here to handle some business and then I was driving home and I went to the four corners right there at um, the 58 and the 395 and I get out and it's like 11 o'clock. It's a hundred degrees out. I mean, blistering hot. And I see this little girl, she's got to be 11 years old. And she just a, she's just a kid. And she's going around asking for money, for uh, food, for her and her mom. So I see her mom over there in the entrance coming in with a sign. And she comes up to me and she's like, you know, excuse me, do you guys have, do you have any, you know, cash? Right. And I said, no, at first. And then I turn around, and I go, you know what? I said, are you hungry? And she goes, yeah. I said, come on inside. I'll buy you whatever you want. If you're hungry. I'll buy you whatever you want. Come on. Right. And she's like, really? I'm like, yeah. So I go in, we go into Subway and I start talking to her and I ask her, you know, hey, so, you know, what's the deal? Are you homeless? She's like, no, we're living over in the hotel right across there. You know, it's me, my mom and my, uh, my baby sister. And I'm like, oh, well, where's your sister? She's like, oh, she's so small. You know, she's at the hotel and I'm just, my heart's just wrenching at this point. And I'm like, well, you know, do you know what you want? She's like, yeah, I'll take a cold cut. And she looks at me, she's like, I've never been to Subway before. And I'm like, what? You've never had Subway before? I said, well, then I'll tell you what, let's get everything. Let's get food for all you guys. So, you know, I get her to get her to get her food and everything. She orders what she wants. And then I hand her some, she says, thank you. And I'm like, you want anything else? You guys thirsty? It's hot out there. You guys want some more water? She's like, no, I think we're all right. So she says, thank you. And gives me a hug. And then she goes out. And at this point, I'm just like, it just, it just, just gut, you know, it's just killing me. You know, I'm a dad too. And if, 
I had, if something like that was happening with my kids, I would just lose it. So I hurry up and pay for everything. And I run outside and I see they've already, you know, they're gotten their food, their food and they're walking back. You know, this wasn't a scam. They were really wanting food. They were starving. Right. So I see them go over and um, so they go into the liquor store and I see that they got like, you know, a soda or whatever. And I was like, that's oh, no big deal. So I drive over real quick and I come out and I gave them, you know, all the cash that I had in my wallet. It's probably like a little over a hundred dollars. And the girl's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. So she starts crying. I'm like, it's still like, yeah, it's hard. So I was like, you know, I hope that this can help you, you know, rather get a night stay in your hotel or feed you guys on your next round. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just, it's emotional. Yeah. No, it's, it's hard out there, man. Like, you know, it sucks is like when you see kids affected, you know, by the, by those decisions that their parents have made, you know, and, and it's, that's hard, man. Oh, and I grew up in, you know, I was one of those kids that grew up, you know, I, I everything that I've earned, I've earned it on my own. My, my family gave me nothing, right. absolutely nothing on my life. I mean, I grew up in a, a pretty abusive home and a broken home as well. So I kind of relate to them. And at uh, one point in time, I actually had ran away from home because I was being abused by my mom's boyfriend. So I made that decision and I'm okay with talking with this because, you know, I've, I've moved on. It's good for therapy and, you know, for everybody to talk about their problems of what's happened in their life. But at 12 years old, I lived in Orange County and I ran away and was living on the streets of Anaheim at 12 years old, right around Disneyland. And you remember back in that time, it was the ghetto. Yeah, it was the ghetto. It was gnarly. You know, and it's fortunate that when the time came, um, I went back to this mall um, to meet a friend of mine so I could get some money, so I could get some food and keep living. The, uh, mall, the mall police caught me and brought me into their station, and I'll never forget this, is they called up my mom and said, you know, hey, well, we found him. And she goes, you can fucking keep him. I don't want him back. And the, I remember the security guard just going, Oh fuck. Yeah. Just looking at me as a kid, I'm 12 years old. Yeah. And so I called up, I called up my brother's parents and they came, fucking instantly came and got me. And that's, you know, been my life as a kid growing up, you know, never given everything at 12 years old. I was taking out trash cans for a quarter and putting them back in for a dime Yeah, to make money and everything. So I grew up a hard life. So, you know, everything that I have now, man, I've, I've worked really hard to get it and to earn it. So I can under aspect aspect. That's why it's like, it's really sensitive to me of that aspect that would happen out there because you it, see yourself in that. Oh yeah. 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 It's, you know, and, and you know, for you, I think, you know, that's the thing is like, you know, that you broke that cycle, right. You broke the cycle of, of abuse that you had as a kid now with your kids. Right. And so they'll grow up and never have any experience that. So the cycle's broken now, which is, Th that is the most important thing that you can do. Like my dad did it for us. Like, you know, he was, he was a hard ass on us growing up. And I remember, you know, being like, man, why are you such a dick? Like, especially compared to the other dads who seemed like kind of mellow with their kids. Right. Like he's, you know, spanking us and yelling at us and, you know, and, and then when we got older, it, it got like, <laughs> it, it, I was talking about the story the other day is like, I think my dad knew, like he put me and my brother into martial arts when we were, I was six. And so by the time I was 12, I mean, I was, you know, beating up grown men. So like when my dad and I would get into it, like, it wasn't like, you know, Hey, you're going to spank me now at 12. I'm like, no, you're not spanking me anymore. Right. Like I'm fuck you. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it like, you know, in retrospect, it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good thing, but like, you know, he, you know, was severely abused as a kid and he broke that cycle for, for us, you know? I think that's like anything in Italian, in a, growing up in Italian, you know, same thing. I grew up in Italian Irish home and I remember my, my dad, oh dude, whipping the shit out of me. Oh yeah. And then, I was, I tell people this and, and you know, I like, I'm, I'm not telling anybody how to raise their kids, although I am, you know, because the world's fucked up because of how people have not raised their kids, you know, like the idea of like me going and 
shooting up a school would never, ever enter into my head because you know why? I'm more afraid of my dad than the cops. Oh, yeah. I remember the first time I got arrested. I didn't care about being, you know, I'm 13. I didn't care about being in jail. I'm like, whatever, you can keep me all night. Don't call my dad. Right. And when my when my dad showed up, even the cops were afraid of him. They're like, whoa, dude, calm down. He's like, where where's Matt? You know? And, uh, you know, and, and later on, it's because he was worried, right? He cared. But, you know, uh, that lack of parenting now, it's part of why society has all oh, the problems it has. Oh, trust me. I mean, you and I, we probably, we got beat by the belt, the spoon. Oh, definitely. The, the coat hanger, the yardstick, the shoe, the wrench. I mean. Dude, my mom, my poor mom. So we got to a point where she couldn't deal with us physically, right? So she she just threw – she would get, like, a pot of water and throw it on us. Really? Right? That was her thing. She's like, you know, because especially I had a brother. You know, I'm my brother, right? And he's two years younger than me. And we would go at it. And we're both in martial arts. So it's like a kung fu movie, right? So normal people would see us kicking each other in the head and stuff. And they're like, what are you doing? But to us, it was – that it's normal. normal. It's like, hey, we we're doing this on Wednesday. We just don't have any pads on now, you know? So, yeah, it was, it was uh, we we were, we put my mom through the ringer, let's just say. Oh, that. yeah. I, I remember, like, uh, I could be literally, like, five blocks away. And I remember this, like, you know, I was, like, probably five or six years old. But, you know, you're playing um, shoots and ladders with your buddies that are, you know, a blocks away. And the light street lights are getting ready to come down. And I hear, I hear what's so I'd be like. Oh, dude, I got to go. Yep. <laughs> I hear my dad whistling. I got to bail. Yep. And they're like, what? How in the hell do you even know that? I'm like, dude, I got dog ears. I got to go. Yep. And sure as shit, as soon as we get there, they're standing there waiting. Yep. And he'd be saying, inside, time for dinner. Yep. 100%. Yeah, that's. I think um, I think those morals were good back. Not, I'm not saying like you know beat the shit out of your children and you know it's the exact same thing. But I, I think discipline is a very very important factors of raising your children because they need to understand that there are there are uh, how would I say this um, consequences. Yeah, I'd say there's severe consequences for your actions these days. Yeah. And these kids actually believe there is no consequences. And I think that's the whole rhetoric that I would say that most liberals and Democrats, you know, run these days. Sure. And, I mean, I'm a Republican myself. I'm, you know, Trump 2024, baby. I'm, right. I don't care if that some bitches. I don't care if he's in jail. I'm still going <laughs> to vote for that guy, dude. Well, it's I can see that because I mean you start looking at the alternates and they're not that great, right? Oh my god! All, although I will say, like I'm pretty impressed with Kennedy, right? Like I'm I'm pretty impressed with like his, uh, you know, his demeanor, you know, what he represents, and the fact that he's not just solely going, oh, I'm just going to toe the line for the Democrats, right? He's like, nope, I'm not down with, you know, restricting people's rights on the second amendment it's the second amendment i'm not messing with it you know stuff like that so we'll see we'll see what happens it's gonna be interesting to say the least oh yeah i'm i'm actually looking forward to it you know when um they go and they start battling against each other I, i'm really looking forward I, to that dude i hope that there is like i i want all of them to get up and have an open debate on rogan like forget the way that the the structure is of like you know, we're going to have the Democratic National Convention, the Republican National Convention. We're pre-deciding who's going to be there. It's like, let's just throw that out. Let's have a chart, like, yeah. you know, like an MM MMA chart, yeah. you know, where it comes to the final, you're in the middle there. And have Joe Rogan monitor, uh, uh, mediate the whole thing as yeah. it goes through. That would be that would be the best thing that could happen for our country. 100%. I think it would be bitching. Well, and, and talking about, you know, stuff outside of racing, you know, both of us are – our, our big fishing guys. I think you get to spend a lot more time than I do, but you know, let's talk about the, the, that a little bit. Like, oh God. You know, so I'm a fishing fanatic. Yeah. I mean, it literally goes fishing, 
family, racing. I'm going to get in trouble for that, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I really dig fishing. It's, it's the, you know, the be all end all. So generally I try and get like, you know, five or six trips and we go down and we go bluefin uh, fishing and it's, it's constantly a contest between, I mean, it, we all know we're all boys and we all have the killer instinct in us and it's all competition all the time. Yep. You know, I've had several exes that were like, why are you guys always in competition? I'm like, because that's the way it is. Well, that's what life is. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to get all wrapped up in it, but like it is a competition and you know, I'm jumping around a little bit, but like, do you think that, you know, you were at a place in your business and your life where you're like, you're good. Like you, you don't need to do this, you know, but like, do you think that you, you know, it's like one of those things, like somewhere inside of you, you really do need to do this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's that saying, you know, what would you do? I, you ever see that movie called brain scanners where the guy's head freaking blows up? Yeah. That would be me if I didn't do racing <laughs> or some type of competition because I just wouldn't know what to do. And the bad thing is, you know, having a little bit of ADD too, does not help as well? Yeah. You know, especially, you know, drinking a bunch of Red Bulls too, it doesn't help as well when you're well, trying to do all this. It's, it's funny because like, that's what I've learned on the, being on the promoter side of it is like. I see people do things with their money and their business and their families and stuff. And from the outside looking in, it's like, well, this is not a good decision. But then when you get inside of it and you're like, I'll use the McMillans as an example. Corky got them into off-road racing by was, design. Corky was a, I met Corky a couple of times. That guy was a really super nice guy. Stand up, you know, just incredibly human being, but he put this racing thing into motion because he saw how it, brought his family together, brought his, the people that he, that worked for him in the business together and their families together. Right. And now, you know, he's created this thing that now is two, three generations deep going to the fourth one. Right. And it's pretty incredible to see that evolve and, and the interaction between, you know, uh, Scott, and Andy and Mark and Dan and Luke. And then now those, those guys are having kids and I'm like, okay, like now what, maybe in 12 years, 10 years, those kids are going to be in a car. Just like I, I remember when Luke was 12, 13 and he got his first 10 car. I took a photo of him doing the McQueen pose in front of it. Oh really? Oh yeah. And I was like, this kid, he's going to be, all in. So, so I was watching Dust to Glory. You know, I always like to refer back and watch it. And believe it or not, I mean, I, I watch all these old videos and I listen to a lot of what the uh, old racers have to say because they give you the points of wisdom of what it takes 100%. to win. And so I go back to that old school thinking of what I'm learning in life and, and racing. So I'm like, you know, God, I'm just, you know, I'll, I'll watch Ford versus Ferrari. I'll read books on stuff. I'll, I'll read commentaries about certain racers and get that little insight. And I try to follow that statue to go through. And I was, was, was watching uh, dust of glory and seeing Scott and Andy. And it was Andy's first race yeah. uh, racing the 1000 in the 10 car class one car. I think he was in, class, was he in the class yeah. one car. Yeah. I thought um, Scott was in the, uh, was in the one car and just watching. I'm like, wow, look at how these kids have progressed over their lives and how good they're doing and how the family the family crest just keeps going in this off-road industry, which I think is great. And, you know, I, I see a lot of other families that are just continuously just keep doing that. I mean, the hearse, the hearse haven't stopped doing it. Yeah. Um, it, it's kind of funny. We were talking about, uh, you know, uh, Jake Capriati is uh, one of a good buddy of mine that is a great fabricator and has done so much stuff. And his background is his parents owned the Baja shop. Right. And, you know, Pepe started it all back in the day. And then it became Jesse and AJ. You know, I, I believe Jesse and AJ are the first ones who actually came out with that truggy design, but the transitions of life of, of how it just keeps evolving and things get better and better. And the families just keep staying in this industry. And that's where I see like, you know, the real Royal crest of it all. Well, um, it's, you're saying industry and it's, it's really a culture is what it is. And, and like the industry part of it's there because it may, it generates money, but it's the culture I think that that is the most valuable part of it. And so, you know, I think I have a different perspective of it because I moved out here when I was 12 and I, so those first 12 years I grew up without it. So walking into it and seeing it, I, I think I understand how much more valuable it is than if you just grew up in it. 
right? Because to your point, you know, it, it binds families, it binds friends, it binds industry, it, the culture part of it. And it keeps reciprocating, you know, I was saying this to a guy the other day, who was like, well, you know, you know, they're a, a investment group that had approached us and he goes, well, why, why should we invest in this? And I'm like, well, because this is a culture, not just a show. And he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, well, Matt Martelli dies tomorrow. This is, you know, what's going to happen. People are still going to Glamis yep. and they're still going to Octeo and they're still going to race. Right. And so that aspect of it is extremely valuable. Um, you know, uh, because it's not something that stops when the economy gets bad or, you know, when it's not in fashion or, you know, when electric cars are being pushed, you know, wh whatever the case is, off-roading is going to continue to, you know, grow and thrive as a culture because it's it's part of the DNA of especially this part of the country. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm thinking back in the day, you know. Fucking Ford Ranger, Ford Ranger pre-runners, those will never, ever go away. No. And that is, that's the one. I mean, dude, when you look at the the VW Bug, we're, we're just, you know, the last podcast we had Blake on. And uh, when you look at the the VW Bug, right? And, you know, I can't even remember how, when the last one was made in America. It was 20 years at least, right? And that people are still driving around the streets, yep. racing them. And now it's like more like class 11s had this huge revival. Now that's cooler, you know, than racing even a UTV, right? Oh, and I'm all over. I've been, I've been thinking about back and forth. It was kind of funny. I was telling Brett King um, before at King of the Hammers, I was like, you know, God, how about you just get in that car and we just go out there and race that thing? Because you're laughing the whole time yeah. you're racing. They're pretty damn fun, dude. Yeah. Like I can tell you, I, I raced one. It's the last time I raced one was uh, in Sonata to uh, uh, in Sonata San Felipe, and I, I did the first leg, and we were laughing our ass off the whole time. So I remember back in the day there were these guys, and you might not remember who they are, but they had a, a class eleven buggy, and it was pa painted a Rastafire a Rastafarian color, and they had a surfboard on the top. And those guys were at every race, mashing, having the great. I remember the guy was super tall and had long dreadheads. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a 16, 17 year old kid going to all these races, right. just going, wow, that is just the coolest thing. Right. And I saw them, and that's a portion when I started realizing that this is a, it's a culture. It's yeah, it, it's never going to go away ever. Yeah. And if you look at the old videos of the standards of racing, how it's evolved, it's quite amazing. It's sad to see that, you know, we don't have 7S anymore. We don't have 7. We don't have 8. Um, the Jeep Speed class, that's pretty much just dissolved and gone. There's no, you know, 1400 class anymore. There's no 1600 class. Um, thank God class 9 is gone. I've driven in a class 9 car before. <laughs> it's pretty so. rough. Oh, Lord. I mean, you might as well just put roller skates on a board and just strap yourself to it and have somebody drag you around a 1,000 miles. Yeah. I think that's probably the pretty much the circumference of what you're going to feel the whole time. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, the evolution of it. People always go, Oh yeah, we have too many classes. We have too much of this. We have too much of that. And I'm like, I'm not the one who decides that, right? Like, yes, we're going to shepherd it and, and try and control it. But like if a bunch of Jeep maniac kids get into it tomorrow and they want to race Jeep speed, it's there. Let's go. You know, if a, you know, a bunch of, you know, kids want to pull Tacomas out of a junkyard and race class seven, same as class eight. I think that there's more interest now in those classes than there ever has been. So we'll see what happens. I think the three, I think it's, is it three and four thousand, uh, th class three and 4,000? Mm -hmm. It's the full size truck. It's almost like a trophy spec truck with the, uh, leaf spring suspension. Yeah. So is one like a fiberglass class and sorry that I'm just not, at, yeah. I, cause I haven't really looked at it, but that's an interesting class as well. I mean, I look at the trucks cause they get to start in front of us and we're faster than they are. <laughs> I was like, maybe joking. not for long. We'll I, was, see. I was like joking with those guys and say, you know, you, well, you know, what? I'm going to pass you. Why don't well, you just go ahead and pull over? Look, look, I'm right behind you. Just go ahead and pull over yeah. cause I'm going to pass you anyways. It's, it's coming. It's inevitable. Yeah, it's interesting though too. Like because the the speeds of the UTVs have gotten so much higher. Like we've looked at that, and like even at the mint, we're trying to give the UTVs their own race, um, just so they can race amongst the same size, same you know horsepower vehicles. Because 
trust me, I've been in a UTV and had to pass trucks in class one cars. It sucks. It sucks. You know, so, you know, that's the thing that's difficult for us to manage is like we have, you know, this massive vehicle disparity and a talent disparity. So it's like, you know, in a perfect world, we could like have all these heat races, right? We just don't have the time. Uh, and then, you know, the other challenge is keeping volunteers out there, right? Like 80% of the people who are running the race are taking time off of work to come out and volunteer. So one thing I will remind people is, you know, if you see the volunteers out there, the road crossing or at a pit or just wherever, just thank them, buy oh, them a yeah. beer, you know? We honk at them every single time we come by and I can't thank those guys enough because it's a tough job. Yeah. Being out there in that heat and doing what they do. I mean, to be honest, none of us would be racing without these people. No, no, it's, it's, it's actually really cool. And I've made friends and met some really cool people because of it. But hey, back to fishing. So okay, what what's the tell me? There's got to be the definitive fishing story, right? Because I've got oh one. god, let's see. There's a lot. So I don't know if you know or not, but um, I think the kid's name is uh, is it Steve McFadden or Mc McFrary? He runs a Can Am. Mm -hmm. Um, I follow him on on Instagram, and he fishes the same boat I do on the tribute out of uh, Seaforth Landing. But I uh, found out that we were at the California 300 and I'd put stickers on the uh, boat and they saw this and they're like, hey, what? Oh, you guys fish too? I was like, yeah. So that's what's cool too is that, you know, um, the, the just the whole network of, of this racing organization between everybody, what we do is, is awesome. But yeah, going back to a story. So I'd say like my top best personal was last year. I caught like 26 bluefin wow. just back to back. 26 bluefin, like 10 yellowtail. And like seven Bonita. I mean, I just, I just freaking killed it. And this, how many days out were you? I was out there for two days. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I generally try to get out there and do a day and a half to a four dayer. Yeah. Uh, four dayer is my fr favorite, but because by, by day two, you're just getting warmed up. Yeah. And if you're just getting into the school of tuna and you're on them and you know, you're st kind of figuring out what they want to bite if they're being finicky by day three, when you're into it, you're like, oh, it's on. Yeah. There ain't no screwing around, but it's rad because, you know, you get out there and you're fishing from dusk to dawn. Yeah. It doesn't stop. As soon as you hear that boat stop, yeah, you're up and you're out there and you're out there on the dock fl uh, flipping a jig. Yeah. Um, it's really cool too. Like what I'm really stoked on is, you know, when I, when we arrived here in the eighties, you know, the fishing was really good and, um, and then it died off and now it's cycled back because of the preservation of the fishing grounds and, and we'll see what they do. Like there's still some heavy commercial fishing that right now, I think I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that they're going to actually outlaw with the big net boats. Cause most of that, most of that fish is going to Asia. Right. Yeah. And, and, and so that's now becoming a thing where people are realizing that going, well, maybe we shouldn't give all the best fish, you know, from the West coast to Asia. Maybe we should bring it into America because honestly what's happening is we're, we're selling that to them because they're paying more for it at a wholesale level. It's not coming to the U S and then they're shipping us tilapia that's been raised in a, in a, uh, it's know, in a hatchery. So what do you do? What they do been, for tilapia is that all your fish hatcheries, so they have sloughs. Yeah. And at the sloughs, they have a sump. Yep. And at that sump, they put carp and they put tilapia. Yeah. So when you're eating tilapia, you're eating- Garbage, eating, poison. You're yeah. eating just shit. Isn't it? But so the, the fishery here in San Diego and, you know, all, all the way down to Baja, but in particular right here in San Diego has started to return, right? Oh, everything, you know, the they're doing a great job out there because, you know, they keep saying that the bluefin tuna is endangered. It is so far from being endangered. There is more fish out there every year than I want to say it was something like, and I don't quote me on this, but I want to say it was like something like a hundred thousand metric tons is out there of bluefin. And this is after the Mexicans and uh, the Mexican fleet and the U S fleet have already gone out there and got their quota. Yeah. And we're finding out the bluefin here, they're not, there are portions of those fish that are leaving the area and migrating. Yeah. But there's a select few that's not. I mean, racing against your dad is something that 90% of the racers in the world will never get. I've accomplished everything I wanted to do. And now he's just like, 
taking the reins. I want to be remembered for being a, a, a huge part of short course, not just racing, keeping it alive, helping it grow. If it comes down to the last weekend and I'm in it, the boys better watch out. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting because, like, I was, you know, in, in high school, like, I wanted to be a marine biologist until I found out what they made. Oh, I think that we all want, we all wanted to be a, a biologist or a, a game warden yeah. so that we could go out there and fish and get paid for it. Well, I, I just wanted to hang out with Jacques Cousteau, man. Like, <laughs> that looks like the life. I was like, throw some surfing in there and I'm in, you know? Oh, surfing, diving, and fishing. Let's, yeah. Let's do it. But the, the funny thing is that, you know, now we're starting to see that return and, and hopefully, you know, gets managed correctly because man, there's nothing like being able to, you know, leave your doorstep here in San Diego, you know, and go do a day boat and come back with, you know, the, just the best fish in the world. Like oh. it's crazy. Like people, it, it, I, so again, growing up in Michigan, you know, we, we had some significant fishing on Lake Michigan with King salmon and whatnot. Oh, yeah. You know, we're trolling, we're catching, you know, 20, 30, 40 pound King salmon. So we're like big fishing. And then I come out here and it's like, no, 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 that's not big fishing. This is the ocean. Now you're, you're catching hundred plus pound tuna. And then the, the flavor of it, like, like uh, if people who haven't had like raw tuna right at that moment are, are missing out. It, it's, it's probably the closest thing to eating pure electricity it's, that you can have. It, it is, just melts in your mouth. Is, it's, it's like butter. Yeah. People, people think of it like, you know, they, they've gotten it at the store or whatever. And like, it's days, if not weeks away from being caught. Whereas if you just get it fresh, it's unbelievable. Once you have that experience, it's this weird connection that your brain makes. Right. And then it's like, I, for me, I just look at, fish now and i'm like it's I can, an addiction i can it, tell you what's good and what's bad oh yeah right and now i'm like you know i i have to have it you know i had sushi last night and it was like b-level sushi so i know like we're gonna go tonight to our spot at the wrench of the road in oceanside and have French and what time is that open uh they open at uh like four or five yeah God, you guys are killing me every single time i gotta hear <laughs> this from you every time about this sushi and i'm like man i got it's i'm like i have to get home at some point you know what i will stay later so i can just go get that damn sushi it's, i'm telling you're you it's ki worth you're it. killing me you're killing no, me I'm, and I'm, I'm on the race diet you know do you realize i'm trying to win a championship <laughs> here matt i feel you i feel you like that's why i'm up in the morning running because i'm not it's not going to come off unless i do you're that. out ready yeah shut up yeah yeah wow. right before dude before covid i was uh i was doing like 15 miles right so Savage. Yeah. Well, I stacked on some weight during COVID. So no, it's time to cut no. that down. <laughs> so I don't, I don't, uh, no, I don't see that at all. But no, I, I, I get it. You know, I'm, I'm back to working out three days a week. Um, you know, at a point in my life, I was a, a professional musician. So I decided, you know, we got, we got the band back together. So I'm a big speed metal fan, you know, Lamb of God, Slayer, used to rehearse right next door to Slayer. So about 14 years old, um, I become so good that I could play a Slayer tune and not even blink about it. It was just, awesome. it was just cake. So uh, long story short, we're back to playing. So I'm back to playing three days a week and realizing, wow, you know, I'm starting to cut weight and getting all to this. And I'm, I'm taking this seriously. And I, I hope everybody else that out, is out there racing is taking this uh, championship seriously for everybody's class. Because if you're not, there's guys that are, that are me, like me that are hungry. Yeah. And we're not going to stop. I'm not going to stop. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm looking what? forward to next year and just putting the whoop on everybody. Okay. So what's your band name? Um, It's called Blood Ritual. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it's funny. So I'll tell you one quick story. Um, So we had this guy that we grew up with here in, 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 in North County. Right. And uh, he was a skateboarder filmer. He worked for us for a while. And, you know, we were both into, you know, heavy music, and punk and stuff. And he uh, introduced me to this band. He's like, oh, um, uh, here's this band. Check it out. They're called Burn the Priest, right? And I was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. They hadn't quite figured out their sound, right? And then that, they turned into Lamb of, the, Lamb of God. Oh, really? Yeah. So that was the, their first band was Burn the Priest. And then, you know, as they kind of figured out their sound, they, they turned into Lamb of God. So... 
we listened to the first Lamb of God album, and I'm like, dude, this is this is you know, I'm a huge Slayer fan. Kerry King's a friend of mine. Yeah, Dave Lombardo was a, was a good friend of mine. Yeah, L- badass. Lombardo's oh, yeah. a badass. And so then, um, you know, I was always looking for like, okay, well, w- what's next after Slayer, right? And I, I, you know, then I, we had Pantera come in. Yeah, Pantera for sure. But Pantera was. It's not Slayer. It's, no, it's in a, in. A, in a, I loved Pantera, and I and I still like it, like a lot of their music really spoke to me. But but it was just it was different. So I was always looking for like what it, what is the band that's going to replace Slayer? Because at some point Slayer is going to age out, and like e- even as long as they lasted, I couldn't understand how they could get up at the age that they were at and perform at that level, especially Tom. Like, yeah, I t- don't know how his, he's a, he, Tom's such a bad, sounds such dude, a badass he, dude. That guy's like, you just see rocking them, that big ass you, beard and just killing but it. But you see them live and the amount of energy that they're outputting to the audience, which is unbelievable. You know, and I was very fortunate to see some of their biggest shows here in the States and, you know, a couple of them backstage, you know? And, uh, so anyways, so, this guy Tyson's like, yeah, okay, cool. I, you know, I, I got a hold of the band. You know, I saw him at this, this venue, and he goes, we're gonna do a show in Carlsbad, at the at the Borge Crossing, and I'm like, what? And I'm like, this, you know, Tyson also did a lot of drugs, right? <laughs> so you weren't really sure whether shit was real or not. And he had a lot. He was with a guy who'd like spout out all of his um, crazy ideas. Tyson Montruccio, that was his name. And he's since passed, but he goes, yeah, we're going to, we're going to have Lamb of God play at Boar's Crossing and Carlsbad. Boar's Crossing is like, it's like a sports bar, dude. Right. So I'm like, okay, I'm pretty sure you're full of shit, but whatever. Right. Go along with it. Sure as shit. He puts on a show and Lamb of God plays at Boar's Crossing. And of course, just the whole thing just blew to pieces. Right. Because, you know. It Carlsbad's like a retirement. Yeah, there's nobody place by the beach, You're gonna have right? Like, you know, a hundred thousand metalheads showing so up. So all here. these all these punkers and Hessians and skateboarders show up, and uh, they had one security guard, and you know the security guard is trying to stop everybody from dancing, and I'm like, D- what are you doing, dude? Like this is gonna happen. Just sit back and let it happen. But yeah, we saw Lamb of God. That was the first time I'd ever seen them, uh, and uh, you know at at a bar in Carlsbad, right? That's- and then, you know, I think it was their second album where they started. I think it was, yeah, I think it was their second album where they started playing, you know, stadium tours, right? Where they were opening for, you know, Slayer, Metallica, Megadeth. I'm, I'm not sure if that was, I think, um, I think it was their first album. Was it Bur- uh, uh, Burn the Chapel? And then their second one is like uh, Ashes in the Wake. Yeah, because Ashes in the Wake was the one that that like really broke them. I dude, feel. it's it yeah. mean between them and like Mashuga and yeah, all those guys, Crowbar. I mean, dude, the music's just great. I mean, yeah. I I listen to it all the time. I I love playing to that style of music. I mean, even you know Slipknot. I mean, all these musicians. Oh, I mean, yeah. it pretty much. I think as me as a kid, I saw it went from Slayer to Slipknot. Yeah. And then years down the line, you know, we had Mashuga come in yeah. and then Lamb of God. And it just keeps the music just keeps progressing and just getting better and better and better. Now it's a lot more technical. Yeah. You know, which is great for, you know, most people look at me and they're like, why can how do you even listen to that music? I go, well, because I'm a musician and it calms me and I, I appreciate the fact of how hard it is to play and the talent it takes to actually make that music. Dude. Chris Adler, the drummer for Lamb of God, um, I was backstage and I think it was Irvine Meadows and um, it was probably the most incredible display of drumming that I've ever seen. And I was, I was seeing it from the back. So he's not a, he's a, he's a pretty thin guy. Yeah. So you could see like all the muscles and stuff, you know, moving in his back and shoulders and stuff. And like, I especially like their, you know, that band and what Chris was doing because uh, other drummers did it too, but they started mixing R and B riffs or R and B beats with metal, like the whole, the breakdown part where it would go from this high tempo to switching tempos down. And then you're playing like you're playing a, you're playing a, uh, 
you know, a rhythm that was, you know, invented by Funkadelic or, oh, yeah. you know, and the first portion of that was Anthrax. Yeah. When they, um, when they did that with Public Enemy. Yeah. That was a start break into the genre of, of this intermixing of music. Yeah. And it, did you, did you ever follow that band Snot? You know, a little bit, yeah. not not too much. I mean, I was into like, you know, semi-mainstream. Actually, I knew the guys from Pantera. So I was playing, I was 14 years old and we were playing shows at like, you know, Je- uh, Jezebel's and Gazari's and the Whiskey. Yeah. And, All um, LA spots. Yeah. yeah. And so I go to the Tower Records over there off of El Toro Road. Yeah. And they're doing a signing there. And me and the band's guys are like, dude, we got to go see these guys. So we go there and I see Phil and, and Vinny, you know, at that time was still a big guy. And I yeah. was, was a big kid and I had my drum set in the car. So I was talking to Vinny and, and uh, giving um, Phil shit about his haircut. He just shaved his head. Right. And Vinny's like, well, what do you play? I go, I'm a drummer. I got my kit in the car. You want to go at it? I go, I can play your album. He's like, you want some? I'm like, yeah, let's go. And the, the tour manager's like, no, 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 you two. Stop it. Stop it right now. But um, no, it actually, we became we became friends after that as well. And That's rad. Um, you know, being just meeting all these guys and just realizing, you know, just like anybody, everybody is just a normal person. Some rock stars take it to way too far where they think they're just like holier than God and they're, you know, some new messiah in this industry. And, and I'm just going to look at him and be like, dude. You're just a normal person. You had a one hit wonder. Sit back there, Rockefeller. Do you, do you hear the music when you're in your when you're in your car? So <laughs> we're we're laughing about this because I was talking to the guys at Rugged Radio. I go, we have to figure out how I can have Lamb of God or Slayer in the car when I'm racing this season, and I want it loud. Yeah, I I mean I want my co driver to have to punch me. Because I'm sitting there banging my head in the car, just just going, yeah. That'd be do- I mean, that'd be dope. I mean, I, but I hear it like it's funny because like I hear it, and in particular, there's a uh, another band that I'm a huge fan on, a fan of uh, High and Fire. Um, do you know those guys? No, I haven't heard them. They're more Sabbathy, right? But um, same thing. There's a song called that they do um, called Fertile Green that has just epic drumming in it, and like when I heard the song. In my head, right away, I'm like, it's a trophy truck going up over the mountain section in Baja. Like that's what it was. That's what it sounds like. It should match visually, right? So I have I have this exact same because I want to do a uh, video of side by sides. And there's this uh, song. It's um, the band's called uh, Upon a Burning Body. Uh huh. And the song's called Extinction. And it's just got the perfect intro to like introducing certain portions of cars and their drivers. I I'd, I'd definitely like to do that. Cause we are, we we're fortunate in that we, we did that in skateboarding. Like we are, you know, involved in making a bunch of different films in skateboarding. And one of them was series of them was, um, you know, ones with, um, Osiris shoes. And so we are using, um, tra- different traps, different tracks from, um, underground, hip hop bands and we were writing to them. We're like, Hey, can we use your music? And, um, they were giving us permission, but consequently, like I know, um, um, the hieroglyphics, we use some of their music and then some of their music got used in some of the eight street videos. And so consequently the biggest, you know, kind of group that is still supporting them are skateboarders, right? Because they got introduced to that music through that. So, I'd be definitely interested in that. Like one of the things that bothers me about a lot of the video content that we produce is we're using canned music. We're using licensed music, right? So, you know, we don't get into trouble for not for using stuff. And, and we've also paid for, you know, in licensed music. The problem is, is that, you know, we, we've, we've done that for a few high profile projects and, you know, you, you buy it for a certain amount of years and then they got you over a barrel. Isn't so, that ridiculous? You think that these guys, you know, me being a musician would be like, dude, we came out with a bitch in hand. I want you to promote our music because yeah. that means we're going to sell more records. Well, I think the the problem is, is that the, the band would agree, but there's a whole bunch of people that are making money on of the band. Course, right. And so that was like, we tried to use some Slayer stuff and you know, they, they played some stuff for me that didn't go on the album. 
And um, we were all pumped. We're like, oh, this is going to be great. And it just got kibosh because it was like, well, here's da, 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 here's the bottom line of how and it's like, going to go. Well, it's, it's going to cost 40 grand because that 40 grand's not going to the band. That 40 grand's got to pay all those administration people, you know, for it because they're on a major label, right? So, but no, that's funny. I, I had no idea. You, do, do, okay, other funny story related to that. So, Carrie's got a new band. They just recorded their first album. I haven't heard it yet, but it's it's like coming. So really, and his words to me were, "It's heavier than Slayer." Really. So I'm pretty pumped about that um, because I think that he was in a creative space where uh, you know he was n- by no means done. So it'd be a good it'd be a good way to. Uh, um, to tie that into off-road racing, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, like, um, I kind of keep an eye on of the musicians and what, you know, people that I've met over the years and what they're doing now. Like, you know, I know Dave Lombardo's uh, playing for Suicidal Tendencies. Yeah. Um, you know, great. one of my other great bands, you know, yeah. Mike Mirror. Fabulous, you know, just oh, dude. A- everything. That's all, you know, so as a kid, you know, I was skateboarding, BMXing, dirt bike racing, um, just, you know, doing the whole Southern California thing. And this is where it all evolved. So, um, always into skateboarding and wanted to open up a skateboard shop over off of, uh, God, it was right by Collins and Tustin over in Orange County. We had this all picked out and I was going to open up a store there. I ended up going to school instead, but, um, I was fortunate enough to actually go skate and meet Jay Adams over in Hawaii. Super cool dudes. I mean, that kid to me in my heart of seeing, you know, Stacy Peralta and, and oh, uh, he was, Alba, he was the guy dude. He was the GOAT, 100%. He was the influencer. He was the guy that took this stuff to a whole new level. Now, and talking to Jay, I understand that he's just not a guy that really cares. He doesn't, he didn't want to be the guy in the limelight. He didn't care about that. I think that was true to some extent, but also drugs, you know, like, like, that was people don't understand like yeah drugs are bad now like fentanyl's killing a shit ton of people but it's it wasn't part of the culture that it is that it was then you know so like that was one weird thing to me about southern california is like being in junior high and having kids overdose on heroin you know that was like a thing that was happening right so you know jay got you know, gra- wrapped up in drugs and yeah, with you know, him and Christian Asoy and, and all that. And, and uh, you know, and that just that's one thing like that drives me crazy now is like, you know, do whatever you're gonna do, you know, but like once drugs start taking over your life and you know, with in particular with Jay, like ruining his creativity and ruining his his energy, you know, and um, you know, just it's it was fucking sad man like i we had a we were doing a documentary on the evolution of surfing and how surfing and skateboarding were connected and you know it really, nev- it really is yeah 100 percent. and i'll never forget like i had him and alva on the north shore and was trying to do interviews with them and you know and he showed up to this interview and he was all fucking iced out and he's like oh let's do this blah blah and i'm like hey man like i'm not gonna put you on film hi you know, because you're my hero and you're a lot of p- other people's heroes. And I don't want to, I don't want to show people this. This is like, whatever I'm not preaching to you. I'm not saying like, you know, whatever, but like, I'm not going to participate in this, you know? And, you know, he's like, oh yeah, it's cool. Blah, blah. And I'm like, just tell me when it's good for you. <clears throat> you know, when, when you want to do this sober, because what we're trying to do, I felt like was a, was a very important conversation about giving him credit for you know creating a culture right and i think we've all seen i think we've all seen friends and loved ones go through this whole aspect of you know meth grabs a hold of these people's man and that that shit is the devil absolutely just appalled about it um i've seen some really good family friends just literally it just fries their brain yeah and they're just not the same person and I could give you stories of, I mean, they're still, the people are still alive, but still, I mean, it is absolutely the, the devil. And um, I've seen people's heroes that I know that have just been high on their minds. And I'm just like, God, you know, you, why do you want people to see? I mean, you were an icon to a lot of people out there. Don't you do this, do the shit at home, dude. Yeah. Just stay out of the limelight that you're, you're high and you're doing this. 
nowadays these kids don't give a shit. They're out there just doing whatever they want to do. And it, it's really, really sad. And I think it sets a really bad example to today's youth. And I think that's another problem where we have issues with today's youth, but um, yeah, Jay, I have, I had a lot of respect for that guy and uh, I've seen him in his moments where that, where they were not too great, but um, I definitely just kind of wash it over my shoulder and, and just the fact of watching him skate and Oh yeah. The, the, I mean, it's just, it's magical. Yeah. His, his ability to express his creativity through skateboarding and style that's part of the reason I am who I am, right? Because I was, you know, fortunately thrown into that by moving here. But, you know, 100%, you can literally draw a direct line from him to all the people that, in to, to him influencing me, to all the people that influenced me. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm sitting here sleeve tattoos and he was one of oh, the yeah. first person that, you know, <laughs> I saw like ha have actually a, a cool tattoo and not look like a, you know, uh, you know, some sh shithead. So. Dude, I, when I saw him put the Charlie Manson one on his hand, dude, I was like, I'm like, dude. Yeah, what are you doing? And, and he's, he's like, yeah, bro, I know, huh? And I was like, <laughs> Oh, yeah. I was like, God, he's so gnarly. Yeah, he was gnarly. On that note, thank you, brother. That was awesome. No, Matt, I think we need like much. another three hours. Oh, right? I know. <laughs> it, it just doesn't stop. I mean, we could talk all day.